There you have another episode of Straight Out of Combat Radio, audio medicine by Green Zone Hero and hosted by the Heroes Media Group. This veteran that you're about to hear is working on a project that is going to completely benefit humankind at the global level. It's an interesting story and a product that is going to change the lives of so many people. This interview is a little bit longer than some of the others, but you want to listen to it in its entirety because the message at the end of this one is so heartfelt and hits home in a way that I've never heard before. Thank you for listening to Straight Outta Combat Radio. Your steely-eyed killer shadow in the night. You were born to fight. You gotta light them up. My name is John Krotek, and I want to welcome you to Straight Out of Combat Radio, audio medicine by Green Zone Hero. We're here to honor the wisdom of America's most valuable asset for combat veterans. We're authentic, we're empowering, we're American. Save us all before they burn it down. For this episode of Straight Out of Combat Radio is U.S. Army Special Forces Eric Walquist. Eric is an 18-year veteran of the Special Forces. His skill sets run the gambit in business, from startups to established companies. Drawing upon his Special Forces training, Eric has built and managed successful marketing, sales, and operational teams. He knows how to communicate with soldiers, civilians, constituencies, and nations. Currently, Eric is the founder and senior vice president of S Development, LLC. This high-tech holding company specializes in the development of vertical applications of a horizontally applicable non-chemical biocide. And we'll get to more of that later on in the show. But I can tell you this, this product that he's involved with is truly going to change the paradigm in water treatment at the global level. Welcome, Eric. Thanks for being on our show this morning. Oh, thank you, John. It was a very nice introduction. Very much appreciate that. Well, you know, I know we've been trying to do this for a while. You've been on the road. You know, you've been out traveling quite a bit and doing a lot of networking. And, you know, we've been kind of doing the same thing. But, you know, we believe wholeheartedly in what you're doing. And and we want to tell the world about it because, like I said, and we've talked about it, and others that I've talked in your in, the, in that sphere of influence truly believe it, it's an incredible product for all humankind. But before we yeah. get yep, before we get there, let's talk about the Walcrest home and what it was like growing up. Well, I, that's that's a that's a story that's still in the making of fifty four years now. But <laughs> uh, the young the young Walcrest home consisted of. Uh, Two very different environments. Um, my father was an IBMer. Uh, he was a senior ranking man on the West Coast, uh, responsible for a lot of people. He was a lead engineer that built the Santa Teresa, Palo Alto, Stanford campuses that IBM is known for in the West in the West Coast, Northern California area. His uh, the downshot there is that he married a rancher's daughter from Wyoming. <laughs> and uh, so we had two two big spheres of responsibility: uh, attend school and get good grades and do what Dad says, and the other was uh, uh, spend your summers on a ranch, uh, riding wild horses and fixing fence and stacking hay and taking care of animals. So almost two different environments, I think, had a huge influence on my development as a young man. Well, um, that's quite a combination I, for sure. You know that. Yeah. yeah, it was it was just amazing. Uh, brothers, sisters, we all had to go. You know, to then that work. As we got older, we got better at things. We oftentimes had to spend longer periods of time and more frequent trips going back and forth between the two. So it became a pretty dynamic. You seemed like you're always living out of a suitcase, always going back and forth. You know, Grandpa needs you for the next three weeks in California, uh, in Wyoming. We got calving going on, and you're like. I just started school. I've only been back in California for a month and a half. Now it's going into October. So you got to take your homework with you. <laughs> you know, take your homework, work, come back. So there's a lot of times on the road, uncles that were driving heavy equipment. I remember moving livestock from southwest Wyoming to the Imperial Valley, California, where 
you had to be there in 18 hours, you know, with a truckload full of young lambs or calves. And, you know, so we had to go back and forth. I was like, I feel like our family was a nonstop deployment mode. Well, you know, always changing. It sounds to me now we'll talk about, you know, did you have any, it sounds to me like that was fertile ground for later on when you made it to the special forces. It was, uh, I, I, I had to think about this a little bit. Am I this way because I served, or did I serve because I'm this way? Um, I, I joined the Army right out of high school. Well, with the exception, I, I tried a semester of college right out of high school. I wasn't doing that well. I think I was uh, playing more than I was working. Uh, and uh, I said, you know, I better enlist before my dad sees my grades. <laughs> so I did. Did you uh did you guys have any in your family tree? Did you have any military in the in the background there? He did. He did. I had two uncles that were in World War Two in the OSS. Um and they fought in the uh uh French resistance. The other was uh in the OSS with the uh assigned to SOE strategic office executive under Churchill. And he actually was in the London Intelligence Network. So we then had a family. We have a history of family that also worked in the intelligence industry after the war into uh, Korea and Vietnam. My father, who passed away, what, a year ago, last October, was in the Korean War. Uh, he was too young for World War Two. His older half-brothers were already serving. Uh, when Korea came out in 1950, he was then at the perfect ripe age as a slightly more mature young man than he would have been, you know, too young for World War II by just a couple of years, and then the perfect age for Korea. And uh, he served honorably in the armed forces, uh, and uh, IBM picked him up uh 1955. Um, they asked him... He actually had a job interview, and they said, what do you know about IBM machines? And he says, well, I, have to, I had to work on them during the war. And so they offered him a job as a feed lead, uh, field lead engineer, and and from there he goes all the way up to executive vice president. Well, sorry, you know, sorry definitely about the loss of your father. I know how that feels. Uh, but would you say that that your dad was your greatest influence growing up? Oh, absolutely. Was actually my, my hero. My hero. Yeah. Um, despite all the crazy uncles I had, some were motorcyclists and some were cowboys and they were all kind of the same. My father was the, uh, was the solid ground in which I based my, most of my big life changing decisions was based on what would my dad do right now. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, so giving so you you tried a semester school and then you it wasn't working you know I kind of get the idea you're probably uh, having a great time and then so you decided to enlist and you were eighteen nineteen years old what was that like? Well, I uh, <clears throat> when I was in college there was uh, an ROTC program and the the NCOIC of the ROTC was a uh, young staff sergeant. Uh, he was had just come back from the United to the United States from an assignment in Germany. He was in Tenth Special Forces Group, and they gave him an ROTC appointment, and uh, he had that for three years while he was getting his own degree. Uh, and then he kind of had quite a big influence on uh, me enlisting into SS. I was uh, when I was in the Army in 1982, and um, uh, back then, SF was recruiting kids right off the street. Yeah, you can go to. We were SF babies, you know, and um, it was basic training. It was uh, AIT, uh, Airborne School. My uh, my feeder MOS was Thirty One Charlie. It was a communications, you know, single channel radio operator, and went to Airborne School. Then found myself at Fort Bragg learning Morse code and going to the Q course and finding myself on an ODA as a very young person without really having any time in the Army. Today, it's called 1800, right? Right. There's a pipeline you can enlist that puts you on a team, 
uh, it'll prepare you for a team, but the training really begins once you're assigned to that first ODA. Because at this point, you don't have really any truly Army experience. You never had a permanent duty station where you had the day-to-day job where you were a cook, a mechanic, a rigger, a, a, you know, a clerk typist. You didn't really have a job. You're just always in training. And that's the first transition is getting to your first team and, and, uh, seeing your game really improve. Um, learning how to really, learning how to really shoot, right? Learning how to really move, have, develop a movement plan that isn't just based around Fort Bragg, Camp McCall to Uwari National Forest, back to Camp McCall, back to Fort Bragg. You actually have long distance movement plans. You really start integrating with a local civilian population of a country now you're visiting and walking through. It was, there are many transitions. Today they use the word transition in the military as if, hey, you're transitioning out and you have to start preparing for your transition. I think a lot of soldiers miss out on being a soldier the last five years of their, of their assignment because now they're preparing for their transition. So a 20 year career really goes down to an effective 15 year career. You know, over 20 years in the service, how many of them are sitting in a college campus? Yes. You know, how many are sitting in a, an assignment that's unrelated to your MOS? This is definitely a great point. I never really thought about it that way. Um, yeah. I mean, so when was your, you know, so you guys are doing real life missions. When was your first deployment, you know, once you made it to your team outside of the USA? Um, nothing really spectacular. I mean, when I enlisted, Reagan was president. Uh, we went south of the border. We went down to little, you know, Central American or South American countries. I think uh, one of my first missions was down in uh, Peru, 87. The Shining Path was really doing a lot. You know, there's a lot of uh, government influence going on between, you know, ideologies of East versus West. And, you know, Reagan, he wanted certain people in certain places to do certain things and it was a real eye opener to travel outside the U.S. At least it was nice when we were traveling in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we were making radio shots back to some guy in Florida who was a ham radio walker, you know, who would make local phone calls for us so we could at least talk to our family. Was, that was kind of a fun experience, you know, a long wire antenna pointing north, and we talked to some guy in Florida who's making phone calls around the country. That's pretty that cool. Was, you know, so, you know, in those early days of Special Forces operations, you know, what were some of your most memorable moments? And then, you know, then we'll get to some combat here. But what were, what was, you know, what stuck out the most in those early days? Um, the suffering of people. Soldiers will come and go. They'll go in, they'll go out. But the look on the people's faces when you, when you come to them, they, they're, they're happy that you're there. Some don't completely trust you because they know you're going to be leaving, and they wonder who the next person is going to be. They don't. They don't think they truly get that life is better somewhere else. I think they do now because of internet and television. Um, but when you would tell people where you came from and what you did, they thought you were crazy that you would ever leave the. the something that was so good to come do something that was just so mundane yeah definitely a perspective that a lot of people don't think about you know and i and i hear this all the time from people you know especially if you haven't traveled outside the u.s and it's always a strong message people don't live like us around the world and and you know eric you raise a great point you know why would you ever leave now we know that there are reasons to leave you know obviously to defend the the nation we live in but mm-hmm. but you're mm-hmm. right you know if you have not traveled outside our borders i can assure you as eric just pointed out they don't live like this it's not it's not it's not as nice yeah john see when i enlisted there wasn't a war going on uh 1982 was a pretty peaceful period up until you know even 91 96 when uh the first attempts, attacks on the USS Cole, the World Trade Center, the bombing in, in Africa, the embassy. <clears throat> there was a, there really wasn't a lot going on, but leaders still put 
soldiers in harm's way for effective change. Being a, at the time, a non-combative, combat-ready soldier, we all prepare for your country's going to need you, but special forces back in the day was, uh, no one knew what you were doing. I mean, my, my mom thought I worked for special services, which means she had to go ask somebody, and they said, well, those are the guys who pass out volleyballs and, you know, tents and, you know, parties. They're the, they're the entertainment crowd. And she thought, okay, that's kind of cool. My son's in a safe place. My father knew exactly what I was doing. And uh, as a matter of fact, an interesting point, he, uh, he had a pretty difficult war experience, and uh, he didn't talk about it until after I had come back from a not-so-friendly engagement, and he says, do you want to talk? And I said, about when he says, you've asked me my entire life, uh, or my your entire life about my time in Korea, is there anything you want to ask me now? And I think my dad peeled back that early layer of uh, soldiers putting themselves in confinement. Um, I'll digress a little bit. I saw a t-shirt of a soldier... There was a, a veteran wearing a shirt the other day that said, this veteran is not medicated for his safety. He's medicated for your safety. Yeah. And I thought, one well, that's humorous, but I thought wearing something as silly as a T-shirt is still keeping him in the void of communicating effectively after he's gotten out. He's wearing his T-shirt with pride. You can tell that he's in the service and he's doing that, but he's also letting people know that, and I'm not right. I need to talk to somebody. You know, you, and, uh, yeah, you, you know, Eric, well, that's, a, that is a freaking incredible point because I'm a, I'm a veteran too. And I, and I'm, I'm a non-combat veteran, but I have witnessed these t-shirts around and you know, the, well, well cute and something we might wear around our brothers and sisters. When you wear these shirts out, in the general public, that's exactly why we have this radio show to diminish the negative stereotype. And what that does is it frequently it reinforces the stereotype, right? And keeps I think so. Yeah, and keeps like what you say keeps us confined. And like one of our taglines is "Unlock your cells." Well, when we talk about unlock your cells, what we mean is, you know, op- expand your mind, open up your brain cells, and unlock the cell that you've put yourself in. If that makes any sense, it does. It does, and I'm not. I'm not where I am by accident. Um, I know you wanted to, to talk for just a moment about my first combat experience, and I've kind of still been reluctant to really talk to some people about it. But here's here here it is in a nutshell. Um, it was uh, 1993. It was RODA was dispatched to northern. Thailand to investigate um, the rumors of uh, violations of uh, civil war order and law and uh, refugees coming over the border from Burma. And uh, we actually had, we infiltrated uh, across the border. We were actually confirming, uh, our team was actually confirming uh, the atrocities happening to uh the citizens of that country against just bad guys. And it was the bad guys were nothing more than uh, the communist interests that were using opium to finance their their war. Today, you know, the, the, the civil war in Burma is one of the world's longest running civil wars. We have the uh, Burma Free Rangers, you know, a, a non-profit organization helping refugees who have been as far as Afghanistan just recently helping people. It's a, you know, I know it's a faith-based uh, organization, but the founder is a former SF guy. Mm. And he s- continues to this day to still put himself in harm's way. And you can read about this part of the country today still with just bad things keep happening to good people. And because it's not making the news, it's not getting the headlines, uh, people don't even know about it, but that was the first time experience of just being in a really bad place and uh, kind of getting caught up in it just a little bit and being told not to engage, but finding ourselves very much having to engage. I came back a very different person there and coming back from a place where we couldn't talk about it at the time. 
Well, so yeah, kind of all declassified now. So when so when you got back, you know, in retrospect on that, you know, and thank you for sharing that. What kept you focused while you were there? What kept me focused while I was there was the importance of my MOS communications guy. I got to kind of know everything that was happening back home where commanders were thinking. I was the, the distribution of information. A commander would pass a note to me. I had to walk out into the jungle and send a message. Uh, one person came with me along with two other local assets for security, and I just kept myself busy. I was I didn't have a lot of down moments of boredom. Uh, I think my mind would not do well if my MOS was, especially the young soldier, if my MOS was not that of a communication sergeant, I would be, I'd be a wreck. Because I'd spend most of my time just thinking about something that I, ineffective, ineffective thinking, where, what do we do? What are we supposed to be doing right now? And there's nothing to do. Your mind wanders. Then you get, then you get uh, lazy in your job. And uh, I think being a combo guy was the best thing for me in the service because it kept myself in the mix. I had to, it made me integrate with the medic team. He needed supplies. The engineers needed supplies. I had to write short, uh, material lists, uh, for the, for the Marge bundle resupply. I had to know what was going on. I saw movement plans and, uh, it prepared me to, after I, after I made rank, I think I went to the ANOC and NCO, they call it, they call it the Advanced NCO Academy. Yeah. Uh, ANOC and then O&I, I became an 18 Foxtrot. And that kind of prepared me as I matured into that role. And I'll make the transition from E6 to E7 on a team. And I saw myself moving into team and management, you know, on my way to become a team sergeant. Um, I had to have a good base of what a, I know what a good ODA looks like versus I've seen a lot of ODAs who couldn't, you know, they love each other. They work well together, but they really don't like each other. <laughs> There's some ODAs that I could never want to be on again. It's like these guys, they're great, but this is just a hard team to be on. You know, there's, they just, there's so 12 alphas in one room. You know, there's going to be, there's going to be conflict. It's like you put 12 guys like that in one room. It's just, it's tough. It's a tough environment, you know. I was like the older, mature teams where the team sergeants were actually fathers who actually had mature kids, like in high school. I like the older team sergeant who was, who was just like, yeah, they'll be like an extension of my own children. I know how to handle them, you know. The young teams, like a young scuba team where the average age is 28, you know, and uh, your commander, your team leader, if he's lucky, he's 32, you know, a young captain becoming a major soon. And he's like, wow. Would, right. Yeah, it's a good. It's, it's kind of funny you point that out because just like any organization, be it military, civilian, nonprofit, the leadership and the mix of the individuals in there definitely uh, are extremely important to the mission. And uh, I can't even imagine what it would be like to ta- have twelve alphas just trying to do things haphazardly or or emotionally. Uh, yeah, I get it. I mean, I, I definitely understand that. Let's you know. So fast forward. To the more the more well known, I, I I had no clue that there was even anything going on like that in Burma. This was the first time. So here I am, talk about being in the dark. But everybody knows about Iraq and Afghanistan. And did you did you have any? Did you play a part in any of those? Yeah, 1988. I went to Afghanistan. Um, I had a civilian job. What, I was I, my entire time was not spent in on active duty. I spent I actually spent six years active duty and the National Guard. I was one of those AGR, Active Guard Reserve guys. I had, to, had six years of AGR time down a full-time ODA in a Special Forces unit in the National Guard. And uh, I remember going to Afghanistan in the early days when the Soviets were still there. This is now 88, 89. Uh, and we were simply delivering the equipment. We took it as far as Pakistan. And then we had to go over the border and deliver it. I remember seeing moving Soviet tanks in Afghanistan. And uh, we were not deployed as an ODA. Actually, we were, de- we were deployed through our several members of our team. Uh, it was a six-man team, and we were simply moving hardware and radio in support of the, 
uh, Mashahadin fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. So those are the, it was, those were it was the guys. A strange period. That was Osama bin yeah. Laden. Early early days, yeah, him and his and his crew of uh, Saudi friends and cousins and relatives, you know, yeah. And we thought, even back then, I thought, man, we're coming back here. I, I know this is going to this is not this is not going to end anytime soon. Yeah, and I think there's a long history in Afghanistan. Haven't those hasn't that country or that area of the world pretty much been in turmoil for centuries? Yeah, and even Alexander the Great entered into Afghanistan, right? Yeah, um, he had a he had a plan, and that was to uh, that was he said he wanted to depopulate the country. It was the only way to uh, to bring it to subdue it. He wanted to uh, export all the women to other regions of his empire for cultural reasons, and he wanted to uh, open trade. Uh, Use it as a bridge, you know, getting across mountains and uh, path to oceans, and he wanted to see it as, a, you know, a place of, a, uh, I don't want to say, <laughs> communication distribution. I, I often thought, why did the Soviets want Afghanistan? And I thought, well, it's it's closer to warm water ports heading south because most of the Russian Navy in the 70s and 80s were always at sea during the winter months. You know, they're, 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 the Navy's always in cold water. You know, Lithuania in north is just cold, cold water. So the Russians always had to have their Navy deployed. Think about that. Yeah. The United States, all of our Navy ports are in warm water. Yeah. You know, we have some stuff in Alaska and up north, but we have the Pacific, the Philippines, you know, Thailand, you know, Ubon. Hawaii. Hawaii, we're always in war. We we can come home and park our ships and maintain our equipment. The other guys get, uh, you know, to shore for some shore. Now, so our Navy is always at sea, but at least it's in places you can get off and resupply. Definitely uh, some great points. I, I, so would it be fair to say that, that that those folks over there, basically it's inherent in their culture, conflict and war? I think so, and this is just to a point. I have a very good friend. Um, he's out in California. Uh, he's actually a member of the team, our uh, S-Development uh, team. Uh, he's a retired Navy chief. Uh, he's on SEAL Team 6. He uh, not only is a Navy, uh, went through BUDS and was on the SEAL team for his almost his entire career. He joined the Navy like I joined the Army. He joined the Navy with the purpose of being a SEAL. I joined Army the Army. Uh, with in, every intention of graduating, completing the uh, special forces training. So very driven person. But while he was a SEAL, he actually attended the special forces 18 Delta medical course and graduated. Uh, he's actually a qualified 18 Delta in the, on the Navy SEAL team and retired. We had some SEALs in the Q course, some Major, vast majority of them who went to the Q course uh, attended uh, attended phase one, kind of our Camp McCall, you know, patrolling and land nav, you know, kind of uh, what we do. Then, and then we go, you know, phase two is your MOS. He did it all. He uh, um, down in back in the, then it was 300 F1, the medical course at uh, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And then you had the uh, med lab for SF guys at Fort Bragg, and then we have Robin Sage, the big you know, big exercise. We get to be on a you know kind of a you know big field training exercise. So uh, he graduated the 18 Delta course, and he's on the team here with us here in Colorado, those in California. And we were talking about just the conditions of the world, and he and I both came up with the same conclusion. And this is what we've seen anywhere we've been in the world. A woman who has access to clean water and education and health care will never raise a terrorist. Think right. about that for a minute. Well, maybe they might get some that get through, but, you know, maybe maybe to solve the world's problems, we need to solve a human rights problem. Well, I might be going on a limb here, but I think that's where the, where the focus is, because I've seen most really bad places in the world, and I just really love being here in the United States. 
Well, one thing, you know what, it's though? It's really I, good here. I don't think, you it's know. It's really you, good here. Well, that, that observation is well taken because, you know, you've been in those places. And basically what you're saying, Eric, some of the basic, basic human needs are met. You know, you talked about water. you got to have water and clean water. But, I mean, just medical care, the things that Americans and people in the civilized countries take for granted. You know, when you turn on your tap, there's water, and you can usually drink it and not worry about getting sick. Or if you stub your toe or break your arm, you can go down to the doctor and have it mended. But it's not like you just, I mean, that's an incredible observation and something that is probably workable uh, from a global standpoint, things that we could actually do with social rights and, and those needs. I think so. And I, it's the perfect segue into, I think, why we're really having this phone conversation. What I'm doing now is that having made a transit, my transition period was over 15 years. I got out in 2004. Um, I have not been part of this last big war effort movement. Um, I have friends that were in basic training. I have a friend who was actually in ranger school when 9-11 happened and he was four weeks away from graduating wow imagine being a ranger student doing well i mean ranger school is not a not an easy course right but what would that do to your psyche as a young person <laughs> in tra- uh, we're going i am now i enlisted I enlisted the Army back in May and June. I got airborne school out underneath me in uh, July, August, something like that. And, uh, you know, he was 11 Bravo, so he was airborne school. Now he's in Ranger. There's a rip. That's and, he, what it was. and he knows he was, he's going. And he knows he's going. He's waiting for that first assignment. You know, he goes to Second Ranger. But I don't think he saw Afghanistan for another year because there's still a lot that had to go into, maybe a year and a half. But, uh, he said, I'm going to have a career in war. And I went, yeah. I didn't, I didn't experience that. Yeah. You know? I well, didn't, I, I, well, tell us, you know, tell us before we get to your current activities, which we definitely want to talk about because it's a very, very instrumental in this whole conversation. Give us a little bit about transition. Were you happy with the transition you had? And, and you had a long transition. So, you know, we don't have to talk forever on it, but tell us a little bit about it. <laughs> Um, my, my transition was extremely long. Um, I got out of active duty, uh, you know, duty form 214 in hand, eight years, came back, went to school, um, joined a, joined a National Guard unit, NSF, one in Utah, one in Colorado. Uh, then I went back active duty for a few more years. I actually have three different duty form 214s for different periods of time of active duty and then transitioning out. So my long-term goal had always been uh, serve where you can, um, do what you must. But my career, my goal in my career was never to actually have a 20-year career. I have a total of 22 years of Army federal service, whether it's active duty, guard, reserve, and and or other, um, but uh, broken up. I never thought my career was going to be even a quote, a traditional career. You know, how do you have a traditional career in an unconventional unit? I didn't think I'd even make it to 30 sometimes, you know? So I wasn't thinking I'm going to do this for 20 years. I always wanted to be out. I always wanted to have a transition out and I find myself back in and back out again. When I got out in 2004, oh, I had gotten out in 1997 and was out, pretty freely and then 9-11 happened i reported the maps passed my physical and was about to take off again re-enlist into bravo company fifth and the 19th in colorado and uh my rep says we need you another way and i said okay what do you want me to do and they said well you passed your physical but you're getting kind of old to be on uh, oda how would you feel about getting back into the intelligence organization and i said do what? They said, well, we have to build some networks. We need some communication networks, early communication networks. So I found myself working just in Langley, Virginia. I didn't even leave the country again until I got out in 2004. So there is a civilian application directly tied to what my former job used to be. It was great. 
I, I would like to think I have the superhuman strength to always be the guy on the ground doing what I have to do. But the transition was easy for me. And then I saw the war unfold. I saw people uh, coming and going, in and out, being deployed. I saw the makeup and the face of the military changing a little bit, too. It, it was an interesting transition. And I think once you live long enough, you're going to see the whole spectrum yeah, um, so- of the ebb and flow. So the transition for me, I was in, uh, I had my own communications company for a while. It was CJW International. We were building cell phone towers. We were doing a lot of uh, fiber optic network construction. Um, we did quite a bit of work around the country and in some developing places. I've always been kind of a technologist. We started S Development roughly nine years ago. It was in a 2000. 2009, I'm talking to a friend who has started a pharmaceutical company, and we're talking about microbes. I knew microbial invasion in oil and gas wells was a, was a big deal. I was now working as a directional driller in oil and gas. I, I've had a couple different careers where I, I, I transitioned from one to another and back again, from, but always in a high-tech uh, environment, having started two other high-tech firms successfully and selling them. I was looking for the next niche, and I found the niche in oil and gas that I wanted to accomplish. I wanted to attack and, and, and make my, quote, my bones. I wanted, to, I wanted to solve H2S and CO2 emissions in oil and gas wells. So what do microbes, so, well, what do microbes do to oil and gas? What, do they destroy it, or how, do, how does that happen? Microbes grow uh, unchecked in an oil and gas well. And what happens is they grow in colonies. When the colonies die, uh, that colony decays and dies, it throws off H, H, uh, uh, H2S and CO2, hydrogen sulfide. And um, it, it's a poisonous gas. It smells like rotten eggs. You know, so many parts per million will kill you. There are deaths in oil and gas fields of... Uh, uh, oil field workers succumbing to uh, H2S. It also causes the oil and the gas to be less valuable. Um, if we use the example of sweet crude, Texas crude, it's you know perfect for a refinery. Uh, say it's trading at fifty dollars a barrel. Contaminated oil trades about uh, as much as eight to fifteen dollars a barrel less. So that difference in price is the delta. And they get, it's less quality of oil that costs more to clean it, uh, costs more for the refinery to blend it so they could, uh, turn it into other products, you know. So I wanted to solve the H2S problem. And we did. We did solve it. We, uh, found a process called, we found a, a thing called analyte. Analyte's been around a hundred years. Um, it was first developed by two surgeons in World War I for cleaning wounds. Uh, you put uh, two electronic probes into water, uh, salt water brine. You run current between the two. Um, <clears throat> the water that grows around one of the probes becomes analyte. Around the, around the cathode becomes a catholite. And that water is measured in millivolts, plus or minus 2,000 millivolts. Well, these doctors realize that analyte in liquid form destroys microbes by taking a uh, portion of the takes a takes a uh, takes an electron out of the protein string of the microbial cell membrane. So it's kind of like being shot in the chest versus being poisoned. All right, there's nothing the microbe can do to prevent itself from self-destructing when you're, when you're, the DNA of that protein string falls apart, that organism just disappears. And the two elements become benign, or maybe a little bit of sulfur in the water, but becomes benign. And so these two doctors in World War I thought, this is great. We're going to save wounds. We're going to save soldiers from bad wounds to infection. The problem with analyte is it's very difficult to make. Uh, the equipment is pretty complicated, although uh, most high school chemistry teachers can probably make analyte, but it would be difficult to maintain in, say, a combat environment. It is susceptible to 
it, it breaks down quickly as a short shelf life, uh, susceptible of UV light temperature. Yeah, how do you, how do you take something like that into battle? Well, with the, with the development of, uh, uh, penicillin in World War II, analyte fell out of favor. Hospitals still make their own analyte as a disinfectant. Uh, they might use it in the process of, uh, delivering a particular, uh, medicine to a patient through IV application. You know, clean the source, kind of flushing an area before you deliver the medicine. Hospitals still do that. So the analyte that you guys are making is a obviously not poisonous, but so it's got a long lasting shelf life. You've created this product. Yeah, we, what we've actually created was a product that once mixed with water becomes HOCl, hypochlorous acid. It's what the body makes naturally. That's what your white blood cells produce to fight an infection. Right. We figured out how to make HOCl outside of the human body. And when we mix it with water, it becomes hypochlorous acid. And it kills all microbes, viruses, spores, fungus, bacteria, cryptosporidium, E. coli, salmonella, all the other bad things that happen. We've had a couple studies done with it already. Oklahoma State, Mississippi State, Colorado School of Mines. The United States Marine Corps tested our product in the Battelle Institute on the use of killing anthrax and botulism. Here's where it gets interesting. One pound of our product makes safe 4,500 gallons of clean drinking water. That's incredible. A, a thousand pounds will make safe a thousand pounds is the size of a pallet, you know, super sack pallet. So we thought we were solving a oil and gas problem. What we realized is that we just solved a water problem. And oil and gas became a very, very small customer of ours. We're still treating oil wells from North Dakota to West Texas to, uh, you know, Artesia, New Mexico. We even got some wells here in Colorado we're servicing. But oil and gas we thought was our focus and it was a happy accident. We realized we just solved the world's water problem. And uh, now that's what's getting us really excited. A thousand pounds will make four and a half million gallons of clean water. Note to anyone who's listening, uh, in January, no correction, February of this year, uh, not quite a year ago, uh, the United States Navy sent to Puerto Rico one million gallons of bottled water and on a ship, right? They load it up in Florida, they launch it to sea, it goes to Puerto Rico. Right. Because they had a hurricane last year. <clears throat> They're still suffering from that hurricane, just like Texas is also dealing with standing water, black mold, you know, panhandle water yeah. that flooded out. Panhandle yeah. in Florida, too. Yeah, right. So, have you ever put your head around what a, what a million gallons looks like, John? It's the size of two Olympic swimming pools. At 250 gallons per pallet, it'll be roughly 4,000 pallets. Wow. That's the, size of a, that's the size of a city street, two lanes wide, uh, probably six, eight blocks long. That's a lot of pallets. That's, that's 40 guys. 40 load operators lifting 100 pallets each or 100 pallet operators moving 40 pallets each. Then you have to unload it. Then you have to distribute it. Yeah. So how do you do that? How do you, how do, you do that? And how long is only a million gallons going to last to a thirsty island of Puerto Rico of yeah. three and a half million people? That water is not going to last more than a few hours if you could even get it to the people. No roads, no bridges. You have trees falling down everywhere. How do you distribute a million gallons of water to three and a half million people four times a day? So the cost effectiveness of shipping water does not make it a valuable solution. The powder does. The powder does. Well, needless so to we say, this to look, SEMA. Yeah. yeah. Needless to say, I mean, you are one hundred and ten percent correct. It's going to revolutionize the water purification issues around the world. Not only in, div yeah, I get it. I get it. I have a friend who, he's a Hollywood actor. He does pretty well. He's an A-list actor. We don't talk a lot, but 
he'll take my call because, you know, we like to chit chat a little bit. He likes to drill uh, water wells in Africa. It's one of those things he enjoys doing. Uh, he'll go there and drill some water wells. I told him, I said, well, how long do those, how long do those wells last before they're contaminated? And there was a pause on the phone. And he says, well, what do you know about that? And I said, I know quite a bit about it. We've talked about this before. And he says, it's difficult to really know how long it takes, but on average, it's about six months. Yeah. I said, so you drill a water well, and in six months, it's bad. And he went, yeah. So we go drill another well. And I said, okay, what's, what's preventing you from keeping it clean? He says, well, animal, animal, uh, uh, disease, it was a dead animal or defecating animal, uh, the buckets that people use to haul their water, they'll pick up out of the rope and the bucket they haul the water up with is not clean. They haul it to the town, they bring it back. That bucket's used for other things other than just watering. Uh, sometimes it's used for um, washing clothes, washing dishes, washing food, washing their, their, their home. And they have a supply, a limited supply of water carrying devices like buckets. And they can't have it so big. They use smaller buckets and more of them and to make transportation easy. He says uh, wind, mosquitoes, mosquito larvae, all sitting on the water. And uh, he says, yeah, he says, what we found, the efficacy of us drilling more water wells is that we're just making more people sick. And I went, that's sad. He went, it's extremely sad. What we do get feel good about is that we get to drill water, and then for a little while, they have clean water. And I said, so how do they do it? And I said, they still have to boil their water, or they have to add chlorine, which is a poison, like bleach. They have to add a limited amount to kill what they can. But now we're still poisoning people with bleach and chlorine. And so he's interested in, you know, getting back. He, had, he sees what we're doing, and he's kind of watching from the sidelines, seeing us unfold this thing you know and uh yeah well it's obvious you know that that you guys are on to something that has a significant value to populations at at the global level you know we're going to talk a little bit you can tell people how to get how to find out more information here but you know a couple things couple questions and uh your wisdom on a few point points here you know uh, what does freedom mean to you and then what kind of message would you like to give to non-combat or non-veteran people about combat veterans? And then your message to your brothers and sisters. Okay. First, getting a hold of us is easy. I'm on LinkedIn. Points to the website, email, and phone number. Uh, look up Radical Sterilant Technologies here in Denver, Colorado. We have uh, some really good initiatives going on right now. So we're actually thinking not only globally, but... Well, can you, can you spell that? Radical Sterilant. R-A-D-I-C-A-L-S-T-E-R-I-L-A-N-T. RadicalSterilant.com. We're doing things locally first. One, we're providing uh, our powder HOCL to the uh, Navajo Indian Reservation here in uh, Arizona, New Mexico. There's a lot of uh, uh, bad standing water that's not good for livestock or crops or human consumption. A small amount goes a long ways, and so we're cleaning biofilm and horse troughs, and we're cleaning water that's feeding crops right now. Uh, we can actually handle the entire food screen of a crop. In northern Mexico, where our lettuce is grown, uh, there's no sanitation for the workers picking lettuce. Uh, so they urinate, they defecate in the ditches uh, beside our lettuce fields. That bacterial waste uh, leaches into the soil, gets in the root system. It's picked, it's grown. Maybe the workers go back to picking, you know, cutting lettuce heads with their machete knife, and uh, it gets created onto a cart. And then now we have salmonella and E. coli breakouts, right? That's what happens. Uh, we're moving into dairy where we're actually cleaning the uh, milking machines between the milkings of the cows. We're flushing those lines with a with our HOCL, killing bacteria. It actually works as a scavenger. You don't have to use any harsh, heavy chemicals. We're in restaurants here in Denver. We're moving into microbreweries uh, here in Colorado. Um, we're moving into other growers, but we can wash the soil, wash the seeds, 
um, we can dilute that product down to as little as five parts per million or up to 500 parts per million, depending upon the potency that we want. And we can clean the soils, the pots, the utensils, the digging equipment. We can free it of all microbial invasion. And then we can actually wash that food in distribution even before it gets to a restaurant and then served. So we're, one product can handle a variety of space within that one industry. Uh, powdery mold, black mold, spores, fungus that's growing on crops here in, in Colorado. Indoor grows, they have a problem with powdery mold. We're fixing that. We're looking at uh, watersheds on the West Coast. We're looking at the red algae plume in Florida. Um, the elections are over with, so now people of influence are now able to take our calls while before they were busy on the campaign trail. So we're really happy the elections are over with, so we can now start talking to uh, department heads, Department of Public Safety, FEMA. Um, we have appointments set. We've, our presentations go very, very well. They love the story. It's a paradigm shift. It's, it's, I think it's going to be, it's going to be huge. Um, I think so too. You know, restaurants. Well, it's yeah. quite obvious that you're definitely uh, into it, excited about the future, and you're already doing some great things. But, you know, again, ba- you know, what does freedom mean to you? I, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna spread the word. A lot of people are listening, but, you know, I want to, I want that message. You know, what does freedom mean to you? And then your messages to those groups of people. Um, freedom, freedom to me is. <clears throat> is movement. I am free to move within my own space and my own country. I don't have to have a border check between Colorado and Wyoming or Arizona or New Mexico. I have freedom of move, freedom of transportation, freedom of commerce. I have a freedom to say what I need to say, and I have a freedom to defend my, my position. Now, my freedom to defend my position ends at the violation of your civil liberties. Like I can swing all, I can swing my fist as high as I want. Right, John, but it stops before it makes contact with your nose. Correct. Right. Uh, Roger that. All right. Okay. All right. So I have a freedom to say what I need to say. And I also have to respect the civil liberties of the person who I'm saying it to. I was recently in a tavern talking to a brewer about our product and conversation of politics came up and someone said, we don't talk politics here. And I went, wow, really? He went, yeah. I said, this is another patron, not, not the brewery, not the head brewery. I said, America was born in a tavern. We had our early founding fathers debated amongst themselves in a tavern with the risk of maybe being charged with treason by the British Redcoat, who's also sitting in that tavern having a pint, okay? Your neighbor could have outed you out. The vast majority of our colony back in our early revolutionary days, they weren't in favor of separation. It was only 3% of United States citizenry wanted to be free. Another 3% supported the war effort by food, clothing, supplies, and shelter. That means 94% of our early colonists did not want change. 94% of our colony were happy with the way the things were. They liked being a part of the British Empire. They wanted to be known as the British colonies of North America, for the Americas. They were happy. Today, that's like being sheep, all right? They just do not quite understand the dynamics of less than 6% of the early revolutionary period that we wanted effective change. That war is still going on today. Some people want to talk about it. Some people don't. Those who don't, I think I've just drank the Kool-Aid and just want to just, as long as they're getting their stuff from Ikea and they can go shopping, you know, they're fine. They don't want things to change. They want things to be better. They want someone else to obviously do it. And so there's still that small percentage of U.S. citizens today who keep enlisting. To my brothers and sisters who have served in battle, I will say this. <clears throat> that does not define who you are. You're much the same person before you went to war as you are after war. 
the hours, the days, the months that you were in harm's way, those are just snapshots in the photo album of your life. It's not who you are. When you're home, you're home. And um, if you got to talk to somebody to kind of decompress from that, find another veteran, talk to them. For those veterans who have served who are not, who have not seen combat, I think you're sensitive to those who are. Um, I'm very happy you suited up. And I'm very happy that uh, because you did suit up, you did serve, that it gave us the ability to keep this country strong. Uh, I've known people who've had 25, 30-year careers in the military who have never seen combat. But they did their jobs and they suited up. You know, John, on the, on the, on the, on the last note about, um, you know, in the books, in the movies, Hollywood, everyone loves the story of the, uh, of the Marine, the, the Navy SEAL, the Army Ranger, the Green Beret. The civilians love to talk about it. Civilians, uh, they love, they make great movies based on those career paths, right? That's what sells popcorn. Uh, there's always some type of action, action movie out there. That's always, some guy, some elite soldier. You know who my modern day warrior hero is today, John? Who's that? As an SF guy, I always knew where I was going, what I was doing, what was expected of me, and when I was coming back. I never went on a mission that I didn't know exactly who's who, what's what, where's where, and why is why. I've always known that. The guy who I have the most respect for is that young E3, E4 soldier who got into a vehicle because his sergeant told him to. And he's going down a road on a convoy, not knowing where he's going, not exactly sure what he's expected to do, and hoping he'll do a good job without letting his team members down. The biggest hero I have is that young soldier who simply served. I have such respect I have more respect for that guy based on my experience than anyone else in the service. That young man, that young woman is just doing the job because someone told them to. And they suited up out of high school. You know, that 21 year old kid right now who's stationed at Fort Hood, Texas or 29 Palms or he's in the Navy and the Great Lakes. <laughs> the guy who simply enlisted in in a branch of armed forces in this day and age, in this in this current political heated debate that we have going on as a country, the kid who still suits up today, I love that person very very much, and I'm happy that they're they're serving, and I want them to be safe. I want them to transition out early and move on with their life because their life is a beautiful thing. You know, uh, do your four years, do your six years, get out, come home. There's just so much, there's just so much that we need you to do here. You know, I don't want to take away from the recruiters who are looking for 20 year commitments. You know, people will make their own choices about how they want to serve their careers. But, um, I want, I want these guys to just come home and, uh, no, do your job, come home. Do your job, come home. You know. Well, that you know that is definitely some great words of wisdom, and you know, appreciate your time and uh, your valuable time to our country and the things that you're doing now, Eric, uh, with RadicalSterilent.com. You know, to help solve some serious issues in the world with water purification. Uh, I can't say enough how excited we are to see. Uh, you take that company as far as you can because we know that it is definitely a concept and a product that will help humankind no matter where you, you take that product. Um, and your your words of wisdom, you know, they hit home and, you know, that gives us a lot of things to think about. There are more things to think about sometimes than, like you say, the, the you know, the things that we take for granted. We We need to really think about those. And there is some young lady or a uh, young man somewhere in this planet wearing a uniform, United States Armed Services, dedicating their lives uh, to making things better here at home. So right. really appreciate you pointing that out. And I hope to, 
to spend more time with you on a future episode of Straight Out of Combat Radio. But thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you for this time. Hope it didn't get too lengthy, too wordy. But uh, John, I always like talking with you. Real talk enough. I think it's been a, it's been several weeks since we really got into it, and uh, I say we do this again sometime. Absolutely, we, we keep disappearing, man. You know, things come up, and the next thing you know, we're 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 off on a on another project or something that we need to take care of. But I definitely second that and uh, look forward to future conversations how we can build our network stronger and be a part of what you're doing because uh, it's a valuable right. thing to, to everybody. Thank you, Eric. You're very welcome, John. It's, uh, I want to move into a phase two and phase three of this conversation because I've given some highlights and I've been I've had to bite my tongue just a little bit <laughs> on some of the current initiatives we have going on. I think by the time we talk again next time, maybe in the next couple months, I'll be actually give you some real stuff that we've done, uh, who it was, where it was, what was the outcome of it. I want to talk about that. And so that's putting fire under me to close a few more deals we have going on, getting some things started. Uh, this story is not over with. This, this, is, this is not over with. And uh, I think the more people hear about uh, this, the, our progress, the more involved we want to be. We're really good at S development, radical, scale. We're really good at setting goals and accomplishing goals. If, the, if new goals are set and we have a track record of closing and completing those things, I think you're going to find people who are going to say, we want to get involved too. Well, we're looking forward to that. And we definitely know that, uh, you know, at the very basic level, if we can satisfy those water purification needs on that global level, then there's no doubt in my mind that S development, radical sterilant is going to change the paradigm. You know, we talk about changing paradigms. Well, you and the people that you're working with and your product is certainly going to do that. So we'll definitely have you back, Eric. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, listen, have a great weekend. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, brother. Talk to you soon. Love you. Love you, too. You gotta light them up before they burn it down. Thank you for listening to another episode of Straight Outta Combat Radio, audio medicine from Green Zone Hero. If you liked what you heard, then tell others about us. Like us and download us. And please remember, freedom is not free. And combat veterans are vital assets. They're not broken. 